Okay, thank you everybody for signing in today. Um, this is uh, one of One Spatial's uh, FME training webinars. We're uh, running a series of uh, training webinars and have been throughout uh, the last few months. Um, a number of sessions have already been covered and we have a, a schedule going up of revised sessions in, uh, in the forthcoming months. Uh, my, name's, my name is uh, David Eagle um, and I'm a Principal Consultant at One Spatial. And, um, I'm going to be focusing on uh, the FME product set uh, this month, uh, looking at uh, how to make the most of data.gov.uk and also open data. Um, so there's a number of topics to discuss around that uh, set of capabilities uh, and we'll be looking at it in the context of uh, using and maximizing your investment in uh, the FME product. So these are free training sessions to, uh, to be able to dial into. Uh, we have um, uh, a number of topics that we're going to cover throughout this session, uh, looking initially at some of the open data initiatives that are out there, where you can go and discover more information about the data that's available, as well as um, different local authorities, different national government agencies that are making their uh, data available in the increasing volume. I often get asked in training um, about efficiency capabilities and tips and tricks to do with writing your FME workbenches. Uh, I'm going to spend some time highlighting uh, a few of those that I find extremely useful. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to build some of these capabilities into your own workspaces. Uh, we're going to look at dealing with um, postcodes, but um, for all of the tips and tricks, I'm really just using uh, postcodes as a um, generally as a topic to discuss some of these capabilities around. So we're going to look at loading some open uh, ordnance survey data into an Oracle database and look at how to work with spatially indexed formats so that we can be more efficient in the way that we read and write our data. We're going to look at how we can consume web services uh, using FME. Um, People will be familiar with web services like a web map, a WMS, and also WFS, uh, web feature services. Uh, we'll take a look at some of those. Uh, we'll also look at uh, how you can work with carrying out geocoding processes uh, using FME. Some of that uh, will lead us on to looking at some of the other Ordnance Survey uh, open data sets, looking at uh, particularly processes to create um, PDFs, and we're also going to spend a little bit of time uh, looking at some of the linked data that is, uh, is out there uh, and accessible. And um, one case example I'm going to look at is the Environment Agency's bathing water quality data uh, and how you can access that and read essentially um, XML uh, published data directly into it. So a number of topics uh, to take a look at today. Uh, the session will be roughly an hour long. Um, I'm going to start with a very brief introduction to who we are, to brand new people that uh, perhaps haven't dialed into these sessions before. Um, our business is called One Spatial. We've been around for a number of years, since uh, 1969. And um, we work with a number of different customers, um, be they uh, local uh, central government um, or national mapping agencies um, and uh, a number of organizations across the globe. Um, our focus as a business is around data quality and data, uh, basically gaining data efficiencies. Um, so we have a number of our own products that uh, we build and create and we also resell um, a number of products um, that fit our capabilities and uh, our focus. One of those products that we work with is a product called FME, and that comes from a vendor um, called Safe Software. They're a Vancouver-based business um, over in Canada uh, on the West Coast, and um, they really have forged a, um, a strong position for acting as um, essentially the middleman for your data, um, taking your data out of one repository and writing it into another um, and um, that's really where FME excels, both in translation, but actually also in the manipulation and restructuring of your data. Um, so that's transformation. FME as a product um, sits very happily between all of the different vendors that you can see highlighted there. And previously in this webinar, we've looked at 
um, specific sessions around um, working with Pitney Bowes software, MapInfo Professional. Uh, we've also looked at uh, working with Autodesk and no doubt we'll be focusing on some of the other uh, environments um, at uh, some point in the future to, to give you an overview. As a business, we have a, a number of capabilities in the FME arena. Um, we both uh, support and work with um, both products that Safe Software produce, that's FME Desktop and FME Server. And we have a significant number of certified staff now in the business um, with four certified professionals and three trainers globally. Um, and we provide a number of services around the FME product set be that uh, product evaluation if you need assistance with setting up a, an FME environment whatever that is to get used to the product then we can help you with that um, and we also have uh, formal training and consultancy packages uh, to assist you once you've bought the software and want to get up and running quickly um, and those training services complement these kinds of free sessions that we, uh, we deliver through this uh, webinar capability. The, um, I noticed from the subscription list this morning and uh, that uh, has been passed to me uh, that we have a number of people um, who are new to FME on the call. Uh, so a very basic overview to begin with, uh, just to highlight uh, some of the uh, capabilities of the product. FME um, is able to read and write um, over 270 different data formats. Um, so it has a, a vast support for uh, working with different data formats, be they um, raster or vector, non-spatial or spatial, database or flat files, um, 3D, 2D, uh, XML, um, you name it, uh, FME has support for a significant number of different data types. Um, and um, it can understand um, the structure and the capability of those data sets so it's very much an interoperability uh, tool that you can use uh, within your organization. I often hear it referred to as a Swiss Army knife, in fact. Um, when you buy FME, uh, you have access to a number of different uh, tools. And um, these are just summarized very briefly here. Uh, FME Workbench is something you're going to see a lot of here. FME uh, Workbench allows you to essentially write um, code without having to write a line of code. Uh, you have a, a drag and drop interface that allows you to connect uh, features or capabilities uh, that carry out tasks on your data. You can view all of your data without having to translate it using the uh, Universal Viewer and the Data Inspector. Um, you can carry out quick translation with a very simple tool that allows you to specify where your data is and where you want it to go and what format and just push go and, uh, and write the data out. And you also have the ability to extend FME, your FME license, into other products like those from Autodesk, uh, Pitney Bowes, and also from, uh, from ESRI or ESRI as well. So a number of different products uh, all bundled up into that uh, FME desktop product. So um, for this session, uh, now I've got the summary out of the way, um, you will notice at several points those blue slides um, splitting up sessions. Um, giving you opportunity to take stock of what we've covered uh, and there will be room for questions throughout so uh, as this is a, an online training session feel free to put messages into the chat window and those, they, they will be relayed to me so I can uh, try and address those in the session. We will hold on at the end of the session as well um, so that uh, if you wish you can uh, dial in uh, or, or dial any of your questions into the chat window and send them over to us at, uh, at the end. Uh, and we'll cover those off uh, um, as, a, as a close. So I'm going to focus initially on some open data initiatives and I wanted to, to highlight a few that um, may already be familiar to you, um, some that might not, and hopefully you'll be able to go out and uh, discover a few more as a result of this session. Um, there's lots of um, sources of open data available uh, to get access to and um, there are a number of data hubs to go and take a look at. The one I'm going to focus on initially is um, the uh, data.gov website. Um, it actually received a, uh, a bit of a revamp earlier this year, but it's around, been around since 2010. So if we just pop that open, you can see in here that this is a, a discovery portal um, that allows you to go and find different data sets 
Um, and you can go and have a look at all the publishers, for example. So we could go and have a look at uh, uh, somebody like uh, the, the Ordnance Survey, um, and you can see that the Ordnance Survey are, are listed here, and it details all of the products that are available from them, uh, some of which are open data, some are licensed. So, for example, if we go to uh, CodePoint, we can go and have a look at a little bit of the detail. It gives you some information about the extents of the data, as well as um, the, uh, uh, the lap long of the bounding box and, and the resource locator to be, go and be able to download the data. It links us straight to the relevant website. Um, so we can find out how we uh, can buy the data. Or um, if the data is open data, um, then if we go to something like CodePoint Open, uh, we can see that there is a, uh, an ordering page that allows us to, uh, to basically go across and uh, have access to the data. So we can see that we can locate the resource. And here, because this is open data, we can go and order it uh, as a, uh, a download or as a, uh, a CD or DVD. So um, that's just a, a way of discovering data. Um, you'll find that you can while away quite a bit of time looking at data.gov. There is a lot of data to, uh, to go and discover. Uh, and towards the end of the session, we'll touch also on linked data. So um, if we just uh, make our way back, um, data.gov itself rather than .gov.uk is uh, the, um, uh, I, I guess, the, the US version of uh, the capability. So again, uh, a lot of data available on data.gov, and uh, um, that has also been around for, for some time. So uh, uh, really, we're um, uh, in the UK making uh, the most of the organization's data that we have out there and allowing people to discover that. Another hub that is interesting to know about is Geostorm um, that um, is a collaboration uh, with the, um, uh, from the Environment Agency that collaborates with some of these organizations uh, that you can see listed here. So uh, Natural England, English uh, Heritage, um, Forestry Commission DEFRA and the Canal and Rivers Trust. So, um, a number of data sets are available to discover and download, but more interestingly, I think there are web services available as well, so both web map and web feature services. Um, you do need to register an account with the, uh, the Geostore, but um, there are licensing terms and conditions that you can read and subscribe to, and if you do that, then you can get access um, to a number of the different data sets at free of charge through this uh, data store. So certainly if you're interested in things like uh, sites of special scientific interest um, and maybe uh, heritage uh, buildings, those uh, sorts of features are the types of uh, data sets that are available as web services for you to consume in your uh, GIS or even just consume with uh, FME and uh, translate into a local data set if that's what you'd like to do. Um, Local authorities out there that are starting to put data uh, and make that available. There's a couple of examples there um, in the UK. Warwickshire and Nottingham are both doing a, a, a sterling job of uh, making data available. Um, both organizations um, use FME behind the scenes to process their data and, uh, and look at making that available uh, through those, uh, those different uh, portals. Um, and also uh, the, uh, the city of Vancouver um, has a, uh, a data catalog um, that um, goes one step further and that uh, is that it allows you to um, create a number of different uh, data sets and make them available uh, in different formats and um, serves them into, uh, into web browsers uh, using things like Google Maps and Bing Maps behind the scenes. Uh, they also have a, uh, the City of Vancouver also has a, um, a, a mapping interface uh, from which you can request data. So that actually, actually utilizes uh, the FME server product um, that uh, Stake Software are always make, also make. Um, open data products, um, I've already alluded and touched on uh, the Ordnance Survey's data. You can obviously, uh, rather than just directly uh, browsing to uh, data.gov, you can go direct to the Ordnance Survey's open data site uh, and go and take a look at the data sets that are available to you. Uh, a number of which can be uh, can be ordered, and I'll touch on those in a little bit more detail in a moment. But there's also OpenStreetMap, and it's increasingly um, a data set that people are considering using. Um, OpenStreetMap.org takes you to the uh, um, the international site that has a number of different uh, 
uh, coverages um, covering uh, the uh, the globe. Uh, so we're zooming into France there, and I'll just pan back out again uh, and dive into um, Oxfordshire, and um, we can make our way. And you can see that this is a web service that, that refreshes. Um, so that's something that's quite interesting. Um, interesting for people in the UK is OpenStreetMapGB.org. Um, this is a, a collaborative site that it's uh, useful to go and have a look at, and uh, I'll talk more about that in a moment. So I'll leave that URL up there for a moment. Uh, that's OSMGB.org.uk. I'll just drag that out of the way, uh, and we'll uh, we'll cover that in in a bit more detail in a moment. So Ordnance Survey open data products that are available. Um, there's an assortment of formats available, and there's 11 products. Um, although I believe uh, there's actually 12 uh, unique products that you can download because um, OS Vector Map uh, District, shortly after its re release, was also created as a raster product. So there is a uh, a raster version of Vector Map District. Uh, a little irony in the naming convention, but. Uh, uh, not one to worry about because it's open open data and uh, the the raster product is a, uh, an exceptional uh, product to uh, to take a look at. Um, the um, the data has been available since April the first in 2010, uh, and as I say, uh, raster data sets are available in uh, for a format like uh, TIFF, and there's also some um, shape files and drawing exchange files, AutoCAD DXF data, as well as some digital terrain models. And FME supports consuming all of those uh, formats as well as many others. So you can use FME to merge and conflate, um, geocode, um, translate, refresh, process any of those Ordnance Survey data sets um, as well. Um, when it comes to OpenStreetMap, um, it's worth just highlighting that the GB instance of this is, uh, is actually a collaborative uh, project that we've got involved in with uh, a number of organizations and a number of individuals um, like um, Surrey Heath uh, Borough Council who uh, who originally helped uh, conceive the idea, uh, James Rutter and uh, we also worked with Stu Stephen Feldman uh, from Nowhere Consulting and uh, we've collaborated with Nottingham University who ho host the, uh, the data um, and this um, is really um, a project that is attempting to deliver a, a number of things, um, notably a, um, a, essentially a QA stamp of approval uh, to the OpenStreetMap data, as well as reprojected data. Uh, one thing that restricts take up of OpenStreetMap uh, in the UK um, is um, the fact that uh, local authorities or organizations have to do some work to the data beforehand. Um, to reproject it into British National Grid or EPSG 27700 um, because it's natively hosted, hosted in that long. Um, you would like ideally to consume um, a web service of the data um, directly into, uh, into British National Grid and um, we also run uh, the GB um, instance of the data uh, through our own technology to uh, apply a number of rules to make sure that features snap um, together so that uh, some of the data quality issues that may be in the source data are uh, removed from this instance so that you can have a, a greater uh, air of reliability around the data set. Um, so um, that's a, a, another thing to, to be aware of. Uh, and uh, you'll see um, in a short while um, the ability to consume that uh, using uh, FME. So, just a, a little bit then about some of the initiatives that are out there at the moment. Um, what I'm going to do now is highlight to you just some of the, the tips that um, I'm going to be covering in the live demonstration aspect of this session. Um, so I'm going to mention some of the capabilities uh, to begin with, um, and then we will drill down into specific workbenches that include some of these capabilities. And the whole idea um, with a lot of the demonstrations that I give is that uh, what we're trying to do is achieve um, flexible workspaces, workspaces that you can apply to a number of different data sets um, where, where possible and um, try and use or, or reuse uh, functions that you build to carry out specific tasks. Um, one of the main things um, to put in place with uh, your 
um, FME workspaces is to try and use a little bit of be best practice to bookmark and annotate your workflows so that users can um, understand in a few weeks or a few months time um, exactly what um, you were trying to achieve in your workflow or even if you look at it yourself you can understand uh, what you've been what you've been doing um, there is also um, a couple of uh, capabilities on um, input and output so on input um, you can merge feature types so a feature type in FME uh, is essentially a layer of data um, and you can use FME to ignore the name of the layer and just read the data into the workflow and that's very important when you have um, say a database or um, ever-changing file names or layer names in your in your data sets and you need to be able to have a, uh, a workspace that doesn't care what the layer or the table is called um, that's very useful when you want to create generic uh, data cleanse or validation routines so um, the capability to be aware of various merging feature types and I'll use the terminology that you would find in FME and also on the output there is the ability to fan out um, fanning out allows you to specify a particular attribute um, that will either help you create multiple files multiple layers for multiple folders um, on your uh, output um, based on that attribute so if you had a um, uh, a lamp post data set, uh, a lighting column data set, and some were made of concrete and some were made of metal, but all of that data was stored in one table, you could fan out uh, on the destination on material type and you would end up with, in that example, two tables or two, two layers of data. One containing all of the concrete lamp posts and one containing all of the, the metal lamp posts or lighting columns. We can also look at uh, working with spatial envelopes. Um, using a spatial envelope is a very efficient way of reading data um, especially out of um, spatially indexed data sets and this is a capability that every format now has uh, but not all of them can utilize the speed efficiencies um, that you can get from a spatial uh, envelope um, unless they are indexed. So we'll, we'll talk about uh, indexing and, uh, and searching uh, spatial envelopes as well. Um, web services are all I've already referred to, uh, web map and web feature services, we'll see those in a little bit of detail and uh, we'll also take a look at working with PDFs as an output format. Um, so I sometimes refer to PDF as, uh, a PDF as GIS Lite because you can uh, write out into PDFs uh, a number of different layers uh, that you can turn on and off in Adobe Reader um, you can also write 2D and 3D data into the, uh, into the layers as well as the attributes that you can interrogate. So it's a very nice controlled way of supplying data to a user that is in its own right could almost be described as an interoperable format uh, because uh, many people have Adobe Reader available to them uh, on their machines. Um, and we're also going to look at working with XML so uh, we'll see that uh, in a little bit of detail. Some of the uh, transformations that uh, you'll see um, utilize custom transformers. Now, a custom transformer is a, um, uh, a construct in FME that um, allows you to take one or more transformers that do a particular job and um, reuse those in different places in your workspace or export them so that colleagues can use those custom transformers. Um, or you could just use them to tidy up your workspace. So you'll see how that uh, can be set up and uh, defined uh, in, a, in a short while. Um, lookup tables are also very useful. Um, I tend to, in my training sessions to, to mention lots of transformer names on purpose because um, finding transformers uh, is a very useful capability um, and uh, working with transformers is, is very helpful. Um, in FME, if I just go and uh, navigate to a quick web page uh, and uh, show you um, that if we go to onespatial.com uh, forward slash FME and uh, I'm just going to browse that page and then drag it onto the, uh, onto the screen so you can see that. Grab it, there we go. So onespatial.com forward slash FME, if you go to the benefits tab on our uh, FME pages um, when that refreshes, you'll see that um, uh, if I 
clicked it, there we go. Um, there is a, an option to download a Transformer Quick Reference Guide. Um, I'd recommend that you get hold of this PDF if you're a, a new or even if you're a, an existing user of FME because this document um, lists in it all of the uh, Transformers that FME 2012 supports and it gives you all the names and all their capabilities and pictures about what uh, what they can do. Um, so um, just uh, take, a, take a look at some of those features and uh, it will really help your general day-to-day -day FME use. Um, I've just noticed we've got a, uh, a couple of questions starting to, to come in. I'm just going to see if I can spot those. Um, so we've got a question about, is FME being used to populate data.gov.uk with data sets? Um, well, not specifically, but in some cases, um, the data that is at the end of the link, it has been manipulated with or created or published with FME. Um, so a few examples that I'm aware of is uh, organizations like Natural England and uh, Countryside Council for Wales um, and the Environment Agency and a few local authorities are building data sets um, that they are populating or creating out of their databases um, uh, and they are extracting those and making a published set um, that they're prepared to deploy uh, from their website or wherever it is that they're hosting that data. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that FME does have capabilities around metadata. So some of the metadata um, that you can see, whether it's stored in Gemini 2.1 uh, or stored in a more generic Inspire schema, that can be built using FME. And if you take a look at um, uh, YouTube and go and have a look at the um, Inspire um, session that I did um, previously, that will give you a little bit more detail about some of those capabilities. Um, so um, if you go and take a look at uh, on YouTube, if you go and search for the channel One Spatial Group, uh, you'll see a previous uh, FME webinar about Inspire that uh, gives you a little bit more detail about some of those uh, capabilities. Okay, so um, just back to this session, um, the uh, the focus that I was going to mention there was that transformers, uh, there are many of them, there's over uh, 400 transformers that give you different capabilities. Um, the attribute value mapper is one of those which allows you to create a lookup. So uh, if you have a feature with a particular ID, um, a numeric value, um, which maps to a sensible value, perhaps somewhere in a spreadsheet, you can bring that value back uh, and highlight, say, a planning application with an ID of one, well, that means that it's passed. Um, so you can populate that uh, a, a string value in your data set with that value. Um, snapping processes you can use uh, with FME to map or snap to a base map. So you can read in portions of uh, a, um, a data set using the anchor snapper uh, and uh, anchor a data set into a particular location. So for example, uh, you wouldn't want to move um, master map, uh, but you may want to specify that as your anchored layer and move your asset uh, to that uh, data set to snap to it. Um, we'll have a look at things like uh, writing SQL in FME as well. So there's a number of SQL transformers that allow you to interact with the database. Uh, a useful one to take a look at is the SQL executor, uh, which gives you uh, quite a bit of flexibility on how you query data. So if you're an oracle or a database person um, and uh, you're struggling to find the right transformer to carry out something in FME, you can just execute some SQL, uh, SQL um, rather than SQL, uh, some SQL and um, I run that and basically uh, in the same way that you would in, uh, in Oracle or in your database, uh, you can run that directly using FME and bring back features based on that query. Um, there are also... Uh, transformers that allow you to work with uh, reading data part way through your process. Um, the raster reader is one of those and I'll highlight that in a little bit of detail. And um, one of the other things we'll cover uh, is the test filter. So um, uh, a number of changes have been made to, uh, to testers in FME. There is a tester and a test filter transformer and uh, those of you who have been on training sessions of mine or uh, spoken to me in the past uh, or even if you've just looked at some of the stats on uh, SAFE's website, the tester transformer is historically the number one used transformer in FME. 
Uh, and um, clearly it needed a, a bit of an overhaul and in the last couple of versions uh, some significant changes have been made to those transformers to make them uh, very capable in, in the eyes of the, uh, the, the everyday FME user. So, uh, just a little bit about some of the transformers that are available in FME and some of the things that we're going to be seeing. Um, for the, uh, the, the latter half of this session, we're going to focus on uh, some live demonstrations. Uh, and uh, we'll look at some approaches, different approaches to data um, transformation and also translation. So um, we're going to look at loading data into, uh, into Oracle, working with spatial indexes, um, doing a little bit of geocoding and working with some web services. So um, I'm just going to um, close down the uh, slideshow and get that out of uh, your way um, and um, just uh, take a look at a few workspaces or processes in FME to uh, allow you to see uh, what we're what we're doing here. So if I go into um, uh, a process first of all uh, that looks at loading uh, Oracle, so we'll open up a um, a process. And um, this is a uh, it's not too big a workspace. You can see that that's uh, not too detailed. There's a handful of uh, transformers. Uh, transformers are these blue and green things uh, and cyan uh, colored processes. And basically anything that is this blue color, um, this plain blue, light blue color here, this is a standard transformer that's available out of the box with FME. Um, some transformers you will see are green and some are cyan in color. These two transformers are custom transformers and these have been built by um, an FME user. In this case, um, uh, I've constructed these but uh, you may have built some for use in your organization. Um, so they do have different capabilities. Um, the, uh, the green basically means that uh, this uh, transformer is um, embedded and available to this FME workspace alone. And this cyan color means that it's available to uh, people who have access to uh, FME in your organization. And that's perhaps a, a transformer that's stored on the network that uh, multiple FME clients can see and can work with. Um, so what we've got here in FME 2012 is the ability to open a containing folder and what that does is open up the folder that uh, stores all of the data and here we have a little bit of, uh, uh, this is uh, code point open data that we've got access to. So I can just dive into one of these CSVs, open it up with Notepad and we can see that we've got a postcode in here and conveniently we have an X and a Y coordinate as well as a series of codes. And those codes don't mean a lot to anybody uh, until you join them to the data sets that they're supplied with. Uh, so if we go and have a look at um, uh, the data, this is just the data that I've got supplied straight off the, um, the download or the CD. And you can see that there are some code lists. So there's an NHS code list. Um, so one of the codes uh, relates to the different um, PCT or SHA area. Um, most of which will be fairly defunct fairly soon, so these uh, uh, boundaries and codes will have to be updated as the NHS changes over time. It's going through a significant transition at the moment. Um, we can see that there's some code lists as well, and these code lists give us an indication of whether the, uh, the postcode is to do with a, a type of uh, authority area and which county, which district, and uh, ward uh, that, those postcodes are in. So we can use FME to look up where um, I have a postcode in code point that has this value, um, does that, um, which ward does that appear within, and attach that to my uh, data uh, in the database. So essentially what my FME process does um, is, as you can see, read in um, the source data um, as well as the NHS uh, and the, uh, the local authority code lists as individual readers. And you can see that they're listed here, the lookup tables at the bottom here. So they go into my custom transformer. Now in this um, uh, process, what I've done is built a custom transformer to carry out a particular task. So to create a custom transformer, you select a transformer grouping and right click on it and choose the option to create a custom transformer. And what that does um, is it gives you, um, in this instance, as you can see, a new tab inside which there are a series of relationships um, defined. So um, essentially 
in this process, all I've used a custom transformer for is to tidy up my top level view of this workflow. And you can see that if I want to, I can close that tab so that the individual user opening this up doesn't get distracted by that process. Um, or we can select it and choose to edit it, and now we can dive in and change any of the content here. So for example, if I wanted that NHS codes um, value there, uh, just to be uh, that port name to be uh, a singular, um, so I wanted to change that to, uh, to NHS code, I can dive over and take a look at the input here, and just go in and double click and change that to NHS code, and dive back. And we can see that it has broken the link, but we just need to rejoin that. But now it's called NHS code instead, so it's directly connected. So all I need to do is just go and join that workflow together again, so that we know that that routes through. And we've got our setup um, process there. So just changing and editing, diving back, and rejoin. So all we've done with this custom transformer is tidy up a workflow and make the workspace a little bit uh, uh, less cluttered. Um, if you want it, this transformer to be used by other individuals in your organization, you could go over to this tab here um, and you could um, basically go in and um, go to export this as a custom transformer. Um, exporting it as a custom transformer gives you a dialog that allows you to specify the name of your transformer the category that you want to slot it into, and define whether um, it's always embedded into a workspace or whether it's linked to the network. Um, and you can specify where you write that file out to. And that is then an FMX file. So a custom transformer, when it's exported, is a .fmx file. And they're available when you set up FME to point to a particular network folder. They will then be available in a number of different um, installations of FME, so you can share those around your organization. I'm not going to go into too much more detail about that. If you want to get in touch and find out more about uh, that capability, then you're welcome to email us um, to pick up on that topic. Uh, and that's at FME at onespatial.com, so you can get in touch with us, with us at any point uh, through that email address. Um, so what happens in this workflow is that we carry out a, a number of joins, um, so I'm just going to dive back into this view. And um, we're, in this case, using a feature merger uh, to join based on a relationship between the code point data, and in this case, the NHS codes. And we're joining where the NHS um, code matches the feature um, in the, uh, the lookup list uh, with also uh, an NHS code attribute name. So we've got uh, that set up. And then any features that pipe out of this workflow um, are um, features that have um, a description attached to them now, rather than just having the code itself. Um, and essentially, the data will pipe its way all the way to the end, and it pops out the other end here, um, now having all of the different descriptive codes uh, that were housed inside those source CSVs. Um, the attribute expression renamer is a brand new transformer to FME 2012 that allows me to force all of those attributes into uppercase. Um, you can do a number of things like um, replace strings or, or carry out uh, processes like uh, put in suffixes, but it's a, a very useful transformer to be aware of, um, as, and that's new to, uh, to FME 2012. Something else that's new to FME 2012 is the FME store. So you'll see that uh, the FME store is available to you in your transformer gallery. You do need to have uh, FME 2012 installed to have access to the FME store. So that's a, an important point. Uh, so the latest version of FME only. If you try and uh, use FME 2011 or prior to that to access the FME store, it will not work. It's a brand new construct in the latest version of FME. You can see that there are a number of uh, transformers available through here. And these are um, custom transformers that somebody else has created. Um, largely, the ones that are available are ones that historically have been available on FMEpedia. Uh, to access them, you double-click the transformer, it connects to the web, navigates to the FME store, and downloads an FMX file. So that's a custom transformer um, that we've been talking about. And you can see that now I have something called the Smart Cleaner on my, on my canvas, 
And this is a unique transformer created by somebody to do something specific that they think might be useful to you. So there's a description of what the smart cleaner uh, gives you the capability of. So that's uh, one capability um, highlighted there. And there's lots of uh, transformers available to, to go and look at um, in, the, uh, in the store. Um, a transformer that we've made available, uh, one of uh, hopefully many, is the UK postcode validator. And you can see that that's uh, on my canvas here. Um, it's available to anybody, no matter where you bought your FME license from. So you can go and download that uh, transformer. Um, you can either get it directly through uh, FME by just typing in um, UK and you'll see that the transformer is available to you uh, to download. If you've already downloaded it like I have, it doesn't have to make that connection, it just makes it available and drops it onto the canvas. Um, if you would like to, you can also find out a little bit more about that by going to our uh, website and uh, I just need to navigate my way back. And you can see that if I go, if I go to the uh, benefits uh, tab, you can see there's a little bit of detail about the, uh, uh, the UK postcode validator here. Um, but you can also um, prove that it's something that is uh, official by going to safe.com. And you'll see that if you go to uh, the FME store on safe.com, uh, you can see a little bit of detail about some of the other third party utilities that have been made available. Uh, like the geocoding capability uh, from DMTI and the, uh, the reprojection uh, capability from CZone uh, that have been added in. So uh, a few things to, to be aware of there. Um, so what happens here is that uh, we literally read our data in, we specify which attribute contains the postcode we want to test, and any valid postcodes are the ones that we allow to come out. And if it's invalid, we'll tell you why it's invalid, and what the problem is, so you can see that there's a result and a result issue, uh, and um, you can choose to throw that data away or fix it as a result of that process. I then do a little bit of attribute renaming, um, and uh, right at the end, I create the geometry. So take the X and Y coordinate and create a point on the map. Uh, so I've also got specified right at the end here a writer. So we're writing directly into the database, and this is an Oracle database. So I'm just going to choose to run this and uh, write this out. Uh, I'm just going to pick one file, so we'll just process uh, CV for the time being, uh, although you could do all of the data in one go if you wanted to. Um, what you can see is that on my reader, I have it set up to merge feature type. So with an asterisk in there, I could read any number of CSVs with the same schema from that folder and process all of that data through in one go. And in this case, I'm writing the data directly into Oracle um, and choosing to uh, send that data out into the Universal Viewer so that you can see the results. If we just zoom in, this is the Cambridge area. I can zoom in and click on one of the postcodes. And you can see that for each of these postcodes, now rather than just having codes, you can see I also have the ward, the district, the county. And uh, we've also got the NHS area uh, that that falls into, as well as the NHS region, because I've looked those up from the data that's supplied with that code point open uh, data. So I can choose which fields I want to keep. What I've also done is loaded that data directly into um, my Oracle database. And you can see if I go to the format parameters, I have both created the table. Um, if the table already exists, um, I've uh, dropped it, but you can choose um, if it doesn't exist, um, you can choose to truncate that table um, to, uh, to basically remove any content that's in there. So there's a number of table level parameters uh, that you can specify at this stage. And I've also created a spatial index. And that's a very important step um, in the workflow. Because now um, I can quite easily uh, go over um, to the next part of the process and read that data back from the database. So. If we just prove that it's there, if I go over to the Universal Viewer and close this view and uh, open up a connection to my Oracle database, um, we can specify um, a connection to my default database. And you can see that if you've added in some credentials previously, you can choose an option down here to specify a particular database as your default. And here is my code point open table, which I can uh, open up and read the data directly back from Oracle. So the data 
in its complete entirety now, having been joined and created it in my Oracle database. And what I'd like to do is show you how I can work with that data once it's in there in a number of different ways. So if it, now we've loaded the data. If I um, just dive over and open up a different workspace, um, I'll read the data in uh, using a, a process here. And you see, hopefully, uh, from the screen, that there's a number of different ways that you could do this. Um, one tip I'll give you is that when you read data from a database, um, where possible, um, you want to try and uh, get FME uh, to do as little work as possible. And this is the case with a lot of different data sets, actually. Um, quite a few data sets give you the ability to uh, query data or issue a where clause or specify a, uh, a spatial envelope. And um, the difference um, is that a lot of systems are optimized to carry out processes, like, for example, a, a database. It's optimized to carry out this kind of processing, um, to filter out content on a machine that's dedicated to it. If, however, you try to do it with FME, what you're doing is you're pulling the data out of that remote repository, bringing it to your local machine, and carrying out an operation there. So what I'll do is show you uh, one approach at the top here is if I add a reader, so if I go to the reader drop down menu and add in an Oracle connection again and I'm going to connect to the same table and basically define a, a feature type definition on the canvas and put that onto my workflow. And I'm using a creator here to create a clipping box. So you can see that uh, this set of bounding coordinates um, is um, the same that I've got listed on screen here. So um, I've created uh, one polygon just here. So just to, uh, just to prove that, um, if we just um, uh, disable this reader and pop a visualizer onto the workflow here, and just run that. We can see that in the Universal Viewer we just have a polygon. Um, nothing too interesting, but uh, the creator has built that uh, for us. And we're going to use that as our clipping geometry, so the thing that's going to clip our data out with. Um, and um, if I uh, enable uh, this reader, in the clipper we have the ability to specify a single clipper and we don't want to merge any attributes onto the data, we just want to clip it out and any uh, point um, on the map that falls inside um, our feature will be uh, essentially clipped out of our data. Uh, so we can run this process and, uh, and process that through. So every feature comes through here and gets clipped against that bounding geometry and only features that fall inside will get uh, essentially processed out. Now, the downside to this process is, and you can see that that's a, an area that's smaller than what we had before, um, the downside to this process is that we have to read all the features into the workflow, and there's 10,000, over 10,000 of them, and we then clip out over 3,000. Um, the alternative mechanism is that um, we do the process on the database first. So if we just uh, cut that out, and, and that process uh, in this case, took um, 9.3 seconds, and the peak memory usage um, was, um, uh, well, I'm going to convert that to about 15, uh, 15 meg um, in, uh, in that process. So if we move that uh, down to here, when you're working with a small number of features, this, this isn't actually going to make a significant difference to the speed this process runs, but when you start working with large numbers, it does make a difference. If we go to our reader and we'll specify, you can see that on the database I have the ability to pass an aware clause. So I could go and get postcodes of a particular type and just read those back. Um, I can also specify a bounding box. So I can type in here that I want to only read back uh, 53900 and uh, min y, we want 252000. Max x is 551. Max Y, and we'll go and pick up 264000. And you can parameterize these, so if you want the user to be able to enter these at runtime, uh, then you can uh, basically pop that up in this prompt and run window, so they have a list to key in at this point. 
Um, you can even specify a, a clipping geometry if you want to. Um, if I use the ability to clip to search envelope, um, we'll say that we uh, want to do that. Now in this example, it's not going to make a really significant difference because we're working with point geometry, but if we have roads, uh, then if we didn't clip, then we would get a spatial interaction, um, which is basically an any interacts. So if we run this process now, um, we'll see that rather than the 10,000 features that we read back, uh, we actually send a, a query to the database, and the database only sends us back the number of features that we actually want. Uh, if I move over to the viewer, you can see that uh, we've got that data back. Now, in, in practice, with this small number of features, as I say, the, the, uh, the process isn't any faster, but when you're working with a much more significant data set, um, that is something to, uh, to strongly consider as a way of reading or consuming your data. And you have a number of capabilities on the reader within the reader's parameters to pass in where clauses um, or uh, individual uh, SQL statements to run before your process is, uh, is carried out. Uh, so have a look in some of your parameters on your readers. Some of the um, more involved ESRI formats like um, uh, file geodatabases uh, have very similar capabilities um, as well as some of the, uh, the formats that are you probably wouldn't think of. So Excel, for example, has the ability to read using a where clause. Um, so uh, it's a, a much uh, more efficient process to make sure that you only pass into the workflow uh, exactly what you actually want to uh, what you actually want to work with. Okay. So um, when it comes down to consuming web services, um, we can uh, use a number of different client tools to consume web services. Um, if we go over to um, the view uh, in the Universal Viewer. Um, and uh, perhaps launch a, a tool uh, like uh, MapInfo or uh, ArcGIS, um, you can go and connect to uh, a number of different web services. Um, so if I just go and open up, for example, a, uh, a web map service, um, we'll dive into um, uh, a web map service like uh, the OpenStreetMap web service, and we'll go and add that into uh, MapInfo in British National Grid. Um, and basically read that into our uh, workflow here. Um, and this will go and issue a, um, uh, a WMS GET request to the service and bring back a raster image um, dynamically in the workflow. And when you zoom in, uh, you can use uh, MapInfo to basically poll that service again and bring back uh, a different feature. Uh, so you'll see that as I zoom in, a, a number of different uh, layers or features will be uh, drawn and rendered on screen. So if I zoom in to a, a, a smaller detail, uh, we'll get that data back there. Um, and that will uh, render on screen, but uh, a little bit more detail. So we'll let that uh, refresh. Uh, whilst that's doing that, if I dive over to, uh, to FME, um, you can also see that FME supports web services as well. So we can open up um, at WMS in a similar way. Um, so uh, we could say, uh, let's go on, uh, read in the WMS um, and um, pick up the same uh, set of layers um, that we are interested in. Um, but this time we're going to um, have to specify a, a bounding box. Um, so um, if I just uh, pop this onto screen so I can see the, uh, the values, um, we're just going to go and uh, natively bring back um, the uh, British National Grid data, and you can see that we can use a search envelope to specify um, that we want Cambridge, so 539 000, I think you get the idea, but I'm just going to quickly run through here, 551 000, and we're going to grab 264 000, and, uh, and basically bring back um, just that small snippet of data um, into the viewer. And you could, if you wanted to, um, add a WMS or a WFS reader into uh, Workbench and write a WMS to a raster image, so send that to a TIFF uh, and a WFS, a, a web feature service, send that out to a shapefile if you wanted to extract that, uh, that bit of data. So it's sending the, the GET request um, over the web and dragging back that, uh, that image of the area that we're interested in. And uh, my web connection doesn't seem to be uh, uh, rocket lightning fast today, but uh, hopefully that will that will refresh in a, in a few moments. So uh, uh, 
Um, behind the scenes, the map info connection has uh, has pulled the service and brought that back. And hopefully, if I dive back to the viewer, here we go. It's downloading the data, and now we can see Cambridge as a raster um, in the Universal Viewer, over which we could overlay our uh, our data if we wanted to uh, in the uh, in the view there. So, um, consuming web services, um, whether they're your own or a, a data set uh, externally, is uh, is fine to do uh, with uh, with FME. Um, and um, once you've got a web service, it could be a web service of one of your open data sets uh, that you want to geocode to. Um, you could carry out a process um, to take any asset data set and geocode it against that reference geography. Um, so, for example, um, I have a, a workflow here um, that uh, if we just maximize this a little bit, uh, you can see that I have uh, one uh, reader that's reading in some CSV data. This is uh, NHS data that I've downloaded um, through uh, looking at data.gov uh, and I've downloaded all of the uh, PCT locations, uh, the SHA locations uh, in the country um, and downloaded those uh, in CSV format. Um, so in order to do that, I just navigated to find um, the uh, the NHS is the uh, the data.gov.uk publisher and found the data that they're publishing and downloaded those data sets and if we dive into one of these you can see that uh, TR contains uh, some of the uh, uh, NHS data and again we've got that scenario where, where we have codes um, and we have postcodes this time around uh, so downloading and working with that data is uh, very easy to do um, what uh, we've got here again is that merge capability to merge on the input file name so it doesn't matter how many CSVs we read in. We're extracting the CSV file name into an attribute and then we're querying it because I, if I, I know for a fact that um, where the feature type attribute um, is uh, PT, well that contains primary care trust information so I'm going to set a layer to be called primary care trust. So this is the concept of looking up a value um, that I uh, alluded to earlier on where we have an attribute value mapper to read in our data um, and I can map the data um, to uh, what it actually is using this workflow. Um, the attribute renamer um, is an all singing all dancing transformer in FME 2012 that allows you to um, rename certain attributes so column one is becoming the name uh, you can create new attributes and you can set values in here and a little known fact is that if you include a column reference in here um, and don't set any of the other values that column will be deleted so it's actually a, uh, an attribute remover as well in this case so that allows me to prepare my data and get it into a particular structure that I'm interested in um, and um, run it through a validation routine that we've seen and then I'm going to send it to the SQL executor. So the SQL executor is an inline process. So you'll notice that I don't have a database reader in this workflow. But this SQL executor connects at runtime per feature to the database and sends a query. So this isn't, this isn't necessarily the most efficient approach. This is just another approach. And it may suit you in a number of different scenarios. I make a connection to my database. I then go and send a SQL query. So if you're a database person and you know how to write queries, I can select all the columns from the table admin code point open where the postcode is equal to the value of an attribute that I'm passing in. So here, the postcode that's on the feature itself. And then I'm going to bring back from the database these attributes so we can pull those back. So we're going to get that information back from our code point data set and join them on to the NHS information that we've passed through. So you can see that if I very quickly run this, um, if I run the query, it'll go and for every feature that it reads out of the CSV, it issues a SQL query to the database, joins to the geometry, the code point geometry, and brings back that geometry feature. And then we'll get to see all of, for example, the PCT properties um, in the Cambridge area because we've got some Cambridge code point data stored in the database. So the SQL Executor is a useful transformer to, to take a look at. 
I would suggest that uh, when it comes to joining data to other locations, you look at the following transformers. There is a transformer called the joiner. There's one called the feature merger. There's also now an inline querier. And if you go and take a look at the inline querier's help, you'll see that there is a significant amount of information describing the different capabilities and efficiencies of several of these joining type transformers. And the SQL Executor is, is one that we're, uh, we're showing here in this workflow. Um, so it gives us the ability to, to add that uh, capability in. What I'm going to do very quickly is just add a writer into this workflow. Um, I have to wait for it to finish before I can do that. Um, so I'm actually going to stop it, uh, add a writer into the workflow, choose the one that we want, and we're just going to write out uh, to our location here. And we're just going to call this um, NHS and write that into uh, a KMZ, a compressed KML file, and um, just write that out uh, into our workflow. Okay, and uh, we can then give that a layer name, so we'll call that NHS as well. Connect that up, and we're going to then copy attributes from a feature type. Now what I did previously to steal attributes is you'll notice that I've imported a feature type um, from the database. So it's hidden down here. This is the database table name. So all I'm using this for is to copy attributes from. So when you copy attributes from a feature type to another feature type, um, what that will do is to copy across um, basically the attributes and the, um, the data types that you have. So we can see that we have attributes and data types. Be careful not to copy just from a transformer um, because if you do that um, then um, uh, you will not get the data types. So we can see here that if I dive across, right click, copy attributes from feature type and choose the input. So this is our um, source data. We've now copied across the attributes and all the uh, data types and appropriate width without having to uh, process that uh, through. Now, uh, in true Blue Peter fashion, um, I'm going to um, open the containing folder um, because um, I don't have time to run that just now. And I'm hoping that I previously did it. Uh, so uh, we'll just go and have a look and see if I did. Yep, thankfully I did. Um, and you'll see here that we've basically got some NHS data. So if I go to the uh, primary care trust uh, process there, we can just dive over to uh, Google Earth and see that in here uh, we now have uh, the PCTs across the UK. So rather than just the Cambridge area, uh, we can go and click on uh, the Milton Keynes PCT building and zoom our way all the way in to spot that. So that's data that's come from uh, data.gov. Um, geocoded against code point open data and then viewed uh, over the top of uh, Google Earth. Um, and because all of that data has an open license, we don't have any uh, intellectual property issues with, um, uh, with Google Maps, um, but uh, uh, you could, of course, uh, use a different backdrop uh, for that uh, process if you wanted to. So, um, we've just got a couple of the last things to, to finish up with, just to uh, show you if you're okay to hang on. Uh, conscious I've overrun a little bit um, from the process, uh, from the, uh, the workflow that I um, highlighted originally. Um, so there's just a couple of other things to, to look at briefly. I wanted to mention uh, a little bit more about um, uh, 3D PDFs. Uh, so this will be a, a brief session just to show you uh, capabilities uh, with uh, 3D PDF. Um, and uh, again, um, we can fire up a workspace uh, whilst that's happening. Um, and um, just to uh, let you know that uh, with um, Adobe, uh, you have the ability to create layered PDFs with version 6 and above uh, of Adobe Acrobat, and also um, version 7 above gives you 3D capabilities, and FME gives you the ability to work with um, the uh, geospatial uh, PDF uh, and uh, also 3D PDF writers. Uh, in the FME product. Uh, from FME 2009 is the important part. 
Um, just have a, a question come in talking about um, whether people can access uh, any of the demonstrations in this session. Um, yes, you can. Uh, you just need to drop us an email. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you contact us at uh, fme at onespatial.com and ask uh, for, in particular, um, if there's any uh, sessions that you're in particular interested in, uh, then we'll supply you with the, uh, the workspaces uh, so you can go ahead and uh, manipulate them uh, for your own use. Uh, these are demonstration workspaces, but we can make them available if you just uh, drop us a, an email. Uh, so uh, that question just in, uh, hopefully that uh, answers the, that for you. Um, also a question about um, working with um, uh, whether you can look at this uh, uh, demonstration after the event, if you've missed anything on here. Um, we'll be posting this up on YouTube, so uh, it will be available. Uh, so if you go and take a look at um, uh, our uh, One Spatial Group channel, and there'll be a URL for that at the end of the session, uh, you can go and see a recording of this in a few days' time. Uh, so the process I want to do is show you working with some uh, open data. Um, and if I just uh, close that down, um, those of you who have seen the, uh, uh, some of my presentations before um, will know that there are capabilities in FME to create uh, 3D data. Um, and uh, 3D can be written into um, PDF quite happily. Um, so, for example, um, if you go to FMEpedia, you can download this uh, PDF. It's a, there's a very useful example on FMEpedia um, that shows you um, how to create this PDF directly with FME. So all of this data has been passed through an FME workspace, um, extruded, um, given uh, 3D faces on the buildings, uh, and you can see that uh, uh, there's a, a number of different uh, layers in here uh, that you can take a look at. Um, and um, this is available if you uh, go and search for um, uh, and spell it Gavel, G-A-V-L-E. This is um, the Swedish town of Yevla. Um, so G-A-V-L-E. If you have a look on fmepedia.com for that, uh, that example, um, you'll see the workspace and the, uh, the output example to show you how that can be created. I'm going to show you a, a variation on that with uh, on the survey data. I've downloaded uh, 1 to uh, 250 thou uh, color raster data from the open data set and landform panorama in DXF. And you can see that that's also available here. Um, if I go and open that uh, with the FME Universal Viewer, you'll be able to see that the drawing exchange file um, is available for me uh, to just open directly in uh, Universal Viewer. And if I uh, zoom in, we can go and see uh, the different layers that we've got available in here. So there's our contour data. And the contours are explicitly uh, located on the 201 layer. Uh, so we can see that. Um, if we want to, we can extrude the Z value and take a look at uh, uh, the height um, using uh, FME as well. Uh, and you can see that um, that's essentially at the moment a 2D data set, but you can, when you read the data, read it in in, th in the third dimension. Um, so, um, if we go over to um, a workflow that I've created um, that allows us to uh, write out um, some data to 3D PDF, you'll see that this is a little bit more of an elaborate workflow. Um, this allows us to read in um, the AutoCAD data and write out PDF data, but you'll notice that this process doesn't consume any raster data. And the raster data, um, the 1 to 250 thou data, is what I'm using to stamp over the top of my workflow. Um, that data is actually read in at this top part of the process. This is an inline process, and this is quite a, a useful technique to be aware of. I'm using a creator transformer to create a trigger feature that goes and fetches a parameter that the user keyed in at runtime. So when you run this workspace, the user chooses the DXF that they would like to process. So they pick the one that they want, and when the user defines that, that determines the um, TIFF file that FME goes and reads. So FME allows me to go and find ny.tiff on that raster path that's defined there. So what my process does here is fetch the file path, the folder name, get the uh, strips out of it, um, the letters, and then concatenates that data to 
the folder with a backslash and the tiff I want with a dot tiff on the end. And then the raster reader transformer reads in the tiff that's required. So it only reads that one file rather than having to go and read every raster file in the whole folder. And the process basically um, clips out the little bit of the raster data that we need and the result is that in this workflow we end up with a PDF that contains contour data, a triangular irregular network, so a face essentially onto which we can drape the 1 to 250 thou raster and turn that into the third dimension and write that into a layered 3D PDF and give access to that content. Now, sometimes when you're opening some of these uh, more complex PDFs, it does take uh, Adobe Reader a few moments just to get itself in order. Uh, but you can see here that if I turn off all the layers, uh, we can see that we have some lakes and we can click on these individual features and report back the attributes. So this is a, a lake that's at a height of 178 meters. And we can go and turn on the contours, turn off the lakes. Um, when the contours are on, you'll see that we can go into 3D mode and take a look at the terrain and query the individual um, geometry. And we can, of course, turn on the raster surface, which has also been turned into a 3D terrain. All of that written with one workspace, consuming some data um, and writing it into PDF. So, um, a little bit of information about how you can go about doing that. As I say, um, I can make uh, this process available to us if you get in, to you if you get in touch. Um, just to conclude, I wanted to very quickly highlight another um, capability through data.gov. Uh, so we'll be uh, three or four minutes just to finish up. Uh, so if we go back to um, uh, data.gov.uk, data uh, we can see there's some linked data uh, available here. Link data is a, an interesting topic um, and uh, you can go and take a look at um, uh, some of the data that's available uh, over here and it's really all about um, giving a, a series of unique identifiers to link between different assets um, on different uh, in different environments. So whether it's a, um, uh, for example, you might have a, um, uh, some bathing water uh, data from the environment agency and you want to know a bit of information about the individual beach that that's related to or the posts um, that mark out the delimiters for the area of that beach. Um, so interesting uh, information to, to go and navigate your way around. And um, Tim Berners-Lee, um, who was the inventor in the, of the internet or is the inventor of the internet, um, or uh, is somebody to, to go and look up and find out more about uh, some of the things that he says about linked data. Somebody who's um, fairly uh, involved with the UK Location Council um, is the guy that you can also see in front of you here, Alex Coley, who works for the Environment Agency and he is uh, doing a significant amount of work um, on linked data um, and uh, making, uh, looking at processes for making that available. The bathing water data is, uh, is interesting um, to go and take a look at. If we just um, have a look at this um, uh, bathing water site accessible via data.gov, uh, you can see that uh, you can go and look, for example, uh, search for an individual beach um, and navigate your way around um, a web map, uh, click on a, uh, a location, and you can see in here that there are a series of maps with different backdrops that give you details about those sites. Um, and find out more about those and link to all of the different capabilities that are available for that data set. Um, go into the bathing water information, the individual sample data uh, for each of those um, and uh, take a look at uh, a, a lot of information related to that. Um, what um, we can see is um, if we uh, go and take a look at an FME workspace that I have uh, in process here, um, so if I just uh, uh, dive down and open up a, a new workspace that I've got uh, open elsewhere uh, and drop that into the workflow. You can see here that um, what I've got is I just steal a, a URL is a URL to some bathing water information uh, that I'll drop into my browser 
and that's a, a, a classic uh, error there. So let's just go and grab that um, URL we have in our reader and drop that across. There we go. So we've got some XML there. Now if I dive into this link and just change that to HTML, we get to see the same page um, as a web page. And we've got a number of ways of viewing it as a CSV or as JSON um, or as uh, an RDF, any number of variations. And we can consume a few of those with FME. So I can add an XML reader into my workflow and read the data in and set the coordinate system to British National Grid and then test the attributes based on whether it is uh, the sample area for that bathing water data um, matches a high minimum or a fail. Um, so I'm using an attribute filter to check a classification name there. And then I'm styling the data into an output. So if I just run this process and write it out, I'm consuming some XML directly uh, from the web, joining to a number of different data sets uh, on the web and writing that out. And you can see that if I then go and open the containing folder, we can open up the bathing water data uh, directly uh, in my workflow and go and take a look at an individual location and click on one of those features and here we have all of the linked data so if we now have the the geography if we want to go and find out more detail about for example the sample point and its reference details we can go straight to it now um, so linked data is an interesting topic I wanted to bring it in here to show you how you can uh, consume XML data um, or uh, information that's out there on the web with your process and turn it into a flat file or write it into your database uh, using FME and some techniques that uh, are available in uh, FME Workbench. So I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining this training session today. Um, that's it for this uh, FME webinar. Um, and uh, there are a few training resources that you can get access to. Uh, if you go to onespatial.com forward slash FME, then you can access uh, information about uh, our services and also download FME, contact us. Um, you can get uh, uh, request evaluation licenses. Um, and uh, you can also find out more about the formal training sessions that we deliver, either classroom uh, in your office or uh, um, at our offices in, uh, in Cambridge. Um, you can obviously comment on this training or get in touch with anything about anything you've seen. Um, the other place I would suggest you go to is fmepedia.safe.com where there are some online resources. Uh, and that gives you access to a number of things like uh, the YouTube channel, uh, the Evangelist blog, and the, uh, the Google group that allows you to, uh, to, to chat to other FME users. Um, so um, just to conclude, this session will be available via our website or directly via YouTube. So youtube.com forward slash one spatial group. Or if you go to our knowledge center, you'll also see our videos are listed there. And this one will be up in the next few days. So uh, sometime uh, uh, probably early next week, this video will be available for you to access. So thank you all very much uh, for signing in today. And now my details are here if you want to get in touch with me directly. You can do, um, alternatively, of course, fme at onespatial.com uh, is the email address to use.